Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. I am really excited to share with you that these webinar series are made possible because of our relationship and our friends at Citizen. We have teamed up with Citizen to get you full control of your medical records so you can find better treatment options, including clinical trials. With end-to-end military-grade encryption to keep your data secure, Citizen ensures that you decide who you share your information with. Your privacy comes first. To find out more about all of these available options to you absolutely free, visit Citizen at citizen.com forward slash SBC trials. Citizen is spelled C-I-I-T-I-Z-E-N dot com forward slash SBC trials, and I'll be sure to link to them in the show notes below. Welcome back to Breast Cancer Conversations, everyone. It is so nice to be speaking with all of you today, and thank you for tuning in and listening to our stories, our voices, and partaking in the conversation with us. In today's episode, I am joined with Jennifer O'Brien, author of The Hospice Doctor's Widow, and Valerie Armand, a nurse and practicing death doula. We cover a lot of topics as we talk about the end of life and continue some of the conversations we've been having on the podcast about preparing for one's passing. This is a conversation that actually is pretty taboo. It's not like we sit around the dinner table talking about planning for one's death, but let's make it less taboo. Let's talk about it. Let's start planning for it. As Jennifer reminds me in this conversation that at the end of life comes death and there are no alternatives. So we might as well make the choices for what type of death we would like to have. These are not easy conversations, and no one's saying that they're going to be easy. But as Abigail says, let's have them before things become a crisis. It's still excruciatingly sad. What it's not is confusing or regretful or remorseful. It, you know, I had the confidence that I was doing exactly what he wanted. Welcome to the conversation. There is such a taboo. There is such a um, hesitation, I think, for people to really talk and prepare for what um, your end of life looks like. I think back on how much time and effort and focus I put into Uh, birthing plans to bring my kids into the world. And um, this is just, I think, a uh, kind of flows from that concept that uh, if we're going to plan for the beginning of life, we should plan and think about what we want at the end of life as well. Jennifer O'Brien has been with us previously. She's the author of the book, The Hospice Doctor's Widow, which basically is her journal that she uh, published. You know, the opening yourself up and being vulnerable the way that you have, Jennifer, is just such a gift to to so many people and and really brings a really difficult subject into the realm of something that's that's manageable. And we also have Valerie Armand, who um, I met, I think, through Jennifer, actually. And she is a LPN and a certified end-of-life doula. She has over 20 years of experience doing this extraordinary Uh, process transition with people. And she has uh, founded a LLC called Exiting Gracefully. And she's also a consultant with Dying Your Way. And her passion is exactly what we're talking about, removing the stigma that society has placed on facing our mortality. She literally does this for a living. So thank you, Valerie, for for being here today. And oh, I have to mention, she has a radio show as well, which is called uh, Mortal Musings. Thank you both, Valerie and Jen, for being on the show today. Jen, if we can start with you, do you mind introducing yourself and kind of the birth of your writing, how you put all of this thought and artwork and day-to-day into your journal, into your memoir. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so I, I have been in healthcare for 33 years on the teaching physicians how to um, run their practices more effectively from a business and leadership standpoint. And um, not too long before that career started, I lost my only sibling. Uh, he, he was in an accident. And I lost my mother some years later. And so 
when in 2010, I was down here in Little Rock, Arkansas and met a guy called Bob Lemberg, who had been a plastic and reconstructive surgeon for a long time, um, but had had a neck injury and so had to retrain. Uh, and he chose to retrain in hospice and palliative care. So after 30 plus years as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, he, he chose palliative care and hospice. And, you know, having lost uh, several people in my family, I knew how important this work was. And, um, and besides, he was really cute and fun and um, smart and all that good stuff. And so we fell in love and we got married. And, um, and then in 2000 and 15, um, he, he found a couple of lumps in his neck and was diagnosed with a metastatic stage four cancer. Um, and so all of that stuff that he'd been through as a physician helping patients understand um, uh, living with uh, serious illness and dying of serious illness and their families and so forth and all of the stuff that I knew from a personal standpoint you know, of course, now that that turned on us, we had, I had to sort of, we had to turn that on ourselves. And, um, and we did, and he lived for 22 months, and I kept an art journal as a form of self care. And I continued to keep it a little bit after he died. Um, and then it turned out that this art journal that I was keeping um, helped a couple of other people who had been diagnosed with life limiting um, illness. And, um, and so I was encouraged to publish it and I, and I found a publisher and, uh, and it was released about three weeks before the, pan before the pandemic started. So. Well, congratulations on your book launch, just like any cancer diagnosis and remembering the day you found out, I think COVID-19 is going to have the same effect on us the day that COVID-19 shut the world down. Um, yes, everything has changed and we aren't going back to the way things were, but I will be sure to link to your book so our listeners and viewers can get a copy and know where to find it on Amazon or your website and can, can read about it for sure. Absolutely. I sent a copy of Jen's book to my medical oncologist. And she was just raving on and on about how every doctor who works with people at the end of life should have uh, Jen's book. Valerie, if we can turn things over to you, if you'd like to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background on how your career has taken shape and how you work with people at the end of their lives. Again, like you had said, I'm, I'm a nurse by trade, um, working in end of life for the past, well, hospice specifically 17 years, but prior to that in, in uh, geriatrics over 20 years total. Um, and really just got drawn into the end of life realm to where I felt as if I had outgrown traditional hospice itself and found myself more and more drawn to advocating outside of the confines of you know, the hospice model and reaching out to folks um, maybe a little more upstream that aren't exactly at that very end stage of life and uh, stressing the importance of having these discussions when we're not in a crisis saying is, you know, it always seems too early until it's too late. And um, all too often that's unfortunately the case where people are making very, very important decisions where we don't get a do over um, again, under pressure, uh, under educated, under empowered, and, you know, not always the most optimal outcomes. We talk about destigmatizing death. And I also use the term desensitizing ourselves to the topics around death and dying end of life. Somewhere along the way, we fell into the delusion that we're immortal and um, or the superstition of speaking about death is going to make it happen sooner. You know, and it's easy for me in my day-to-day -day operations to, to speak so freely about it. Um, I have experienced death, not just professionally, but personally uh, within my own family. But um, it's really been uh, very life-changing for me to have met you, Abigail, and your world. Um, because, you know, conversation is one thing, but it's, it's really your reality in a lot of ways. Um, a little more pressing, I suppose, than the fact that we all are going to die. We just don't know when. The depths of your day-to-day -day operations and things that you all are, are dealing with, um, your current realities, 
and still having the courage and, and the, the spirit and the wherewithal to, to be reaching out and supporting others, I think is just so beautiful. So I'm really humbled to be a part of your world and um, just like to be able to help in any way that I can. And uh, whether it's guidance, mentoring, uh, just general information. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Valerie. And, and it is quite, I think, um, perfect that we, someone, a guest has said in the last four, at least, uh, webinars about this, talking about things, making decisions and making preparations before there's a crisis, before there is, you know, you must go to hospice now because we have nothing else for you. Having thought through and researched what you want and what's available to you, uh, before that crisis is so important. We heard that in the legal context. We heard that in uh, kind of the, this medical context, uh, whether it's palliative care or hospice care. We just keep hearing that concept over and over that thinking ahead um, and preparing is so important. And so with that, I want to come back to you, Jen. When did you and Bob start talking about the things that he wanted at the end of his life? And how did that come up? Oh, we talked about it very freely from the start, um, from very early in our relationship because of his work and because of my personal experience. You know, my, my brother was in this accident and he was um, in a coma for three weeks and then um, there was not sufficient brain activity. He had a case of meningitis that sort of attacked the remaining portion of his brain that was active. And so my parents had to decide to extubate him. And so, and that was when I was 18 years old. And so with what Bob dealt with pretty much every day at work, yes, we, we spoke about it very freely from, from early on in our, in our relationship. Valerie, you mentioned in your intro about being able to empower people with some of these choices during their end of life. What does that look like? How do you empower someone at this stage in their life? Can you give us some examples? You know, one-on-one -on -one is a lot easier. They'll tend to be more open and more honest and just flat out say, you know, I'm tired. I don't want to do this again. They're offering me another treatment, but I know it's not, you know, going to make any difference. You know, it may make a little difference, but it's not worth it to me, you know, and, but it's so much more powerful for them to, be able to do that in front of their family. It can be uncomfortable and awkward, but it's just, again, really, again, goes back to making your wishes known ahead of time and how you want things to go and that, that, you know, for them to say they're okay with whatever that looks like. It's not a one and done conversation usually, you know, but it's, it's a great launching point. And then, um, you know, again, with what I get to do on a daily basis, it's really, again, just amazing to be part of that journey. And yeah, it's, it's a little overwhelming at times, but the reward, um, knowing that if we didn't have those conversations, how things may have looked a lot differently and not necessarily in a positive way. Now, Jen, in one of our previous podcasts, you talked about going through the dying process with Bob was one of the most intimate times that, that you all had together. And um, it, it sounds like Valerie is, is talking about this, this powerfulness of being able to talk about your wishes with your family and then really understand that. And it sounds to me like you and Bob had that. W would you talk a little bit about that? The entire thing was, was um, pretty intimate from knowing the details of what he wanted, you know, being the one who knows um, that I knew that he wanted to die in inpatient hospice, not at home. I knew that he wanted a mild palliative sedation. I knew that he didn't want any visitors at the very end. Um, we we uh, went through all of our things and we sold our house and moved to a much smaller a condominium so that I would be comfortable after his death living here alone. Um, and as we went through things, you know, um, art, he was a big art collector and other things. He, he would tell me and ask, you know, are you okay if I give this to my niece? Absolutely. Or I would like you to give this to so-and-so after I die. 
Um, he wrote a number of letters and at times asked, you know, to people who were very meaningful to him. And most of the time asked me to sort of read them, you know, proofread them, whatever kind of thing, and then mail them. And so all of that, yeah, was super, super intimate. I wouldn't trade that for anything. I mean, it just, it's, it was a, it was a level of, of intimacy that, um, you know, I had not, you know, I had a closeness with my mother as she was dying, but it was nothing like, like, you know, what, how Bob and I came close together. Jennifer, I know you mentioned that Bob was a hospice doctor. What role did that play in him being able to choose that he would prefer to die with inpatient hospice care versus dying at home? So Bob died when he was 68, no, 69. And he had started working in a hospital as an, what was then called an orderly, which was sort of a nurse's assistant kind of person. And when he was 18 years old and wow. he, and at, at 18, his father, who had been a physician also said, you have to go work in the county hospital as an orderly to see what this thing's all about. And he did. And an orderly this was a, not only was it like more of a nursing assistant, but it was also like what we now call environmental services. So cleaned up after people. He, I mean, he, the orderly did it all. This was just an old position that just doesn't exist anymore. And, um, and he loved it from the moment he started taking care of patients as an orderly at age 18, he absolutely loved it. And so by the time he died, he had spent over 50 years in a hospital, you know, the bulk of his life. He freak, he was a very, very shy um, person. So, so it was through work that he was able to kind of really relate to people. He often, he, and, and we didn't have kids. Uh, he didn't have kids. So he frequently, um, volunteer to be on call on holidays so that his partners, you know, could be with their families for the holidays. And so, I mean, he just, he was more at home in a hospital than sometimes he really felt at home. So he knew he wanted to die inpatient status. I I think for us, the hardest thing, um, and I've, you know, I've kind of reworked this in my head, but I think he didn't realize how I, how well I knew that and how important, you know, that I knew that was really important to him. Um, but you, you have to be fairly, um, you know, sick, uh, to be admitted to an inpatient status. And so, um, he didn't end up inpatient until about four days. He was outpatient. He was at home hospice for, um, probably close to a week and then um, inpatient for like the last four days. Um, But yeah, so so he just had this idea. A lot of people have the idea that they wanna die at home. And, and, um, you know, sadly actually, um, something like 75% of us think we wanna die at home and only 25% of us are actually able to do that. Wow, that's so interesting. Why do you think that is? Part of it is because we don't talk about what we're talking about right now because certain things happen when when kidneys fail, when certain things happen, people can't be in their homes, right? If they if they go to the hospital and their kidneys fail and they have dialysis, and, and again, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know, but there gets to be a point, right, where someone has so much support in an inpatient setting and they're going to die, but they can't go home. And, um, and I think one of the ideas of backing this conversation up to earlier in life is that we're gauging, well, now if I do this, you know, am, am I going to be able to meet that goal of, di- of dying at home kind of thing? Are we going to potentially get us into a situation where I can't die at home and, and encouraging you know, knowing that at the end of life comes death, that that's how, that's how it ends. I mean, there's there's no there's no alternative. There's no different outcome for for anybody. And for someone who has a diagnosis like metastatic cancer, 
you know, it's going to, it's going to happen probably that much sooner. So trying to gauge if that's your goal, then trying to gauge as you, as you say yes or no to these additional treatment options, um, you know, how's that going to impact that ultimate goal? Such a great reminder to begin with the end in mind, right? I think that applies to, to so many, so many different things, but Valerie, I wanted to go back to you. How do you have those conversations uh, with people about where it is they want to die? And and how do you, do you just ask it like that? Like, where do you want to be when you die? Or or do you back into it in a more politically correct way? You know, it's um, every, every situation is entirely different. Um, usually it's an organic conversation, kind of have a way of getting to all the kind of topics we need to touch on. Um, I wish there was a textbook way to describe it. <laughs> um, it's almost like, uh, I want to say there's an art to it. Just being able to meet people where they're at is so important. Just coming in with acceptance, no matter what their answers are going to be, whether I agree with their answers or not. And, um, it's almost kind of like, I want to say a CSI <laughs> kind of just feeling out the situation, um, the dynamics of the group, whoever it is that you're with, you know, whether it's, you know, adult children or sometimes it's siblings and sometimes it's their parents. Um, and people can be on all different levels. You know, there's usually that one person that's, you know, right spot on knows, you know, what the patient wants. And then there's usually one of those rogue (laughs) outliers that are just, well, we're not just going to let her die here. What do you mean? She's just going to starve to death and we're going to sit and watch her starve to death. And everybody's looking at them like, no, that's not what we're going to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. I, I usually just say a really big prayer and I don't know sometimes how I, you know, the words come and, but I just feel like it's definitely a gift because again, you just, it's just like uh door number one, door number two, door number three, and you don't know what door you're walking through and who you're going to meet because I get a lot of cold referrals that, you know, I just, I may have paperwork with clinicals and, you know, all the hospital jargon and, and all. And sometimes they look way worse than you're anticipating. You know, they're very, very much more sick and frail than they looked on paper. Um, and sometimes it's completely the opposite, you know, on to be flip about it, but I mean, a train wreck literally on paper and then you meet them and it's like, who's the patient, you know? <laughs> so it, it's always very interesting and very dynamic and you just got to be quick on your feet. And, um, and sometimes you'll have an entire conversation and everything sounds one way. And then a few days go by and you revisit and it's like, did we even have a conversation, you know? So sometimes it's, like I say, it's a journey. And the, and the earlier we begin that journey, the more time people have to process in a healthier way and, you know, at their own pace rather than a rushed, you know, we're being discharged from the hospital and you have to go home on hospice and this is just how it is. It's a little late then to decide if you want to die at home or if you want to die, you know, in a facility or if you, you know, have to put, you know, you don't, you're, there's sometimes people are just not capable physically to provide 24 hour care in the home for maybe an elderly loved one. Uh, we're living longer, we're working longer. People are still working in their 60s and 70s and their parents may be in their 80s and 90s. Um, and it's just, it's a lot, it's a lot. And then you add the financial burden on top of that. People can't afford to miss a paycheck. And by the same token, it's not cheap to have caregivers, even if you paid a bare minimum of $10 an hour, four hours a day, that's $40 a day. But then you multiply that out by six, seven days a week. That's a lot. Sometimes we have families that don't even know and their loved one can no longer speak for themselves. You know, do they want to be cremated or do they Mm -hmm. want a traditional burial? And financially, that's a huge difference. There's a great website called Funeralocity. It's funeral like Travelocity, um, where you can go in, put your zip code in, and it'll pull up all the providers for funeral homes and cremation in your area Mm -hmm. with the prices. 
So now, you know, I had said on my show this past week, there's really no excuse for people to really start exploring. It's not even, you don't even have to make a phone call in the privacy of your home when you're in a certain kind of headspace. Go on your computer and, and you know, and in the doses that you can tolerate to Google some things and to break that ice and to start researching out of, you know, even if it's just sheer curiosity, it's, it's not your current reality, but it will eventually be. Um, and it may even be information for you to help others that are struggling. When I think about Abigail, you know, I think you and I, both being those diagnosed with breast cancer, talk about choice and how empowering you were asking about, like, how can we empower each other? You know, it's it's having that choice, right? So, so much has been stripped already, but what do we have control over and what can we decide and have these conversations? And that in and of itself, I think, is incredibly empowering and hopeful, right? Like, okay, yes, we are talking about death, but if I get to choose how I want that to be, it could be a very beautiful thing. And as we're coming to terms and making sense of our own realities, I think that is just another tool in that toolbox of, okay, well, do I want flowers and what type of music or do I want like to be at home? And then I love those ideas of, okay, well, then having those conversations with your oncologist and your medical team to make sure that you're setting those goals and working towards those goals. You all having the courage to have the conversations, um, what a blessing and a gift for your family to not not only not have to ask so much, but to not have to, you know, you're, you're, they'll be executing our wishes or your wishes or whoever has the courage to, to voice them. Even if you haven't written them down, at least you gave the family something to work with. Um, so that takes that, that uh, giant burden of making choices for someone. It completely flips the script. Oh, absolutely. Um, that, 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 that's, that's the bottom line is in all of this, I think is, you know, Bob used to say the patient's going to be fine. It's the family you worry about. And, and the fact all that, that we, Bob and I talked about all of this, it, it didn't hasten it. It didn't delay it, but, and it didn't make it any less sad. I mean, it's still excruciatingly sad. What it's not is confusing or regretful or remorseful. It, you know, I had the confidence that I was doing exactly what he wanted. Not only up until the moment he took his, his instant he took his last breath, and then as we honored him with his memorial service, and you know uh, all of those things that went with it. So, and just to, to, to be able to focus simply on loving him and then missing him and mourning him instead of wondering how I was going to pay for it all, you know, spending time, um, doing, you know, I don't even want to think about if he hadn't wanted to sell the house and, and move into the smaller space and sort of get things, straightened up for me. If I had had to do all that by myself after his death, um, it, it, it would have, it would have been just so much harder and, and awful than it, you know, like I said, it didn't take away any sadness. I, I still miss him every single day. Um, but I, but I also am unburdened of a bunch of administrative stuff and I am, um, bolstered by the fact that I know for a fact that he felt loved and cared for exactly as he defined that um, till the very end and beyond. So, so that's a, that's an excellent point, uh, Valerie, as to what it does for, for the family, for the survivors. While you're caregiving, you are managing your own proactively, prospectively managing your own survivorship. Um, I had a, a, a big day one day when Bob and I had an argument and one of the pages in the journal is, you know, we're going through two different processes. He is dying. I am surviving. They're intertwined, um, but I, I will be here and I will... I will have to live with how I conducted myself. Um, I will, I will have to live, you know, 
with myself afterward. And um, that that survivorship is so important to your well being as you as you go on um, with with life. And I I have just really wonderful memories um, of of loving him, you know. Uh, up until the end and and things come up and I you know I I thank him we we set up my survivor benefits with the veterans administration and so like every time I schedule a doctor's appointment I say thanks Bob you know because we took care of that so um yeah so your survivorship and your memories you're making your memories and you're carrying them with you. and you and there won't be a chance to do to do over there, there won't be a do-over in all of the caregiving, and there won't be a do-over in end of life. There, there will be one, one time. Jennifer, that's such the honest truth. Sometimes it's hard to hear things we don't want to hear, right? At the end of life comes death. It's inevitable, and you only get one chance at it. I want to let our listeners know that I'm going to re be reaching out to you, Jennifer and Valerie and Abigail, and work behind the scenes to put together a one pager of all of these amazing resources that we're talking about for caregivers, for patients, for hospice care, for death doulas, et cetera, because this, we're not in this alone. And I feel like it is a resource that because we don't talk about it at the dining room table, as I started off this conversation, um, you know, we don't really know about it. What happens at the dining room table is we hear stories about how we don't want to die. We hear the gossip of, have you heard what happened to so-and-so? Gosh, I hope that doesn't happen to me, right? We'll be putting together that one pager, so please stay tuned. We will be having a blog coming out with it and resources on our website. I would like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to share such amazing, beautiful stories with us today and taking the time to be on Breast Cancer Conversations. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our podcast. If you would like to find out more about our organization and upcoming events and ways to connect, you can find out more by visiting our website at survivingbreastcancer.org. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast is from personal experiences and it is not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always consult your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, feel free to contact me directly at laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. And of course, we have a couple social media handles you can follow us at as well. For example, Surviving Breast Cancer Org, all one word, as well as our podcast specifically, Breast Cancer Conversations. Until next time, keep on thriving. <laughs>